But first, I want to pick up something that happened on Friday while I was on leave in relation to Labor's Indigenous voice, because it's too important not to pull it apart, and it's just more evidence that this voice is very far from the modest expression of goodwill that the Prime Minister likes to claim. Last Friday, the Parliamentary Select Committee on the Voice Referendum released 91 submissions. Now, they're from former judges like Ian Callanan and Terry Cole and former senior MPs, including Tony Abbott, former Prime Minister, and Philip Ruddock, a former Attorney General. As well as a whole lot of people who have been in the thick of this debate, such as Warren Mundine, Noel Pearson, and, of course, Frank Brennan. The only one that's had much attention, of course, is the submission of former of the current Federal Solicitor General, Dr Stephen Donoghue, KC. Now, the government's been trumpeting the Solicitor General's advice that the proposed voice is, and I quote, compatible with our system of government. But all that really means is that a voice would not be entirely incompatible with it, although it is an entirely made-up innovation, unlike anything else in our political system. And the Solicitor General's advice that the Parliament can legislate about the voice's operations is clear. But what about the Solicitor General's advice? Or what about what it doesn't say and what it can't settle? And that is, of course, that the High Court could and would strike down any legislative attempt to restrict, restrict what the voice might do. Remember, the Constitution always trumps legislation from the Parliament. The Constitution is supreme over the Parliament. And the Constitution means whatever the High Court says it means. The Solicitor General says that the proposed amendment does not require the Parliament or the Executive to consult with the voice and that it does not impose any enforceable obligation on the Parliament or Executive to follow the voice's advice. But just because the consultation and consideration is not specifically required does not mean that it's not expected. Indeed, notwithstanding the Solicitor General's view, there's every reason to think the High Court could precisely find this is an implied right under the Constitution. It's worth noting that this published submission is not necessarily the same advice that the Solicitor General earlier reportedly gave the government and the referendum working group. This was all about whether or not the term executive government should be dropped from the proposal. We get his submission. I don't think it's the advice. Indeed, as I know firsthand, there's often multiple advice memorandums sent up from the Solicitor General on important policy issues or legislation as things evolve. So if the government was being fully transparent here, Every single bit of advice from the Solicitor General would be released in full and not just what they put out on Friday night. It should also be remembered, as former High Court Judge Ian Callanan points out in his submission to this parliamentary committee, that it's not the Solicitor General anyway who's got the final word on what the Constitution means but the High Court. And that the Solicitor General, however eminent, well, they don't always turn out to be right. Callanan in his submission says, and I quote, there would hardly be a lawyer who did not believe and expect that every representation from the voice had to at least be given consideration. Say the voice gets up and the PM's version is then enshrined in our constitution. Then imagine next year the parliament legislates that the voice could only make representations on matters specifically related to Indigenous people and that neither the Parliament nor the Executive had to heed representations from the voice. Now, there would not be a lawyer in the country who'd maintain that such a provision could survive High Court scrutiny. Indeed, that's even the view of the Solicitor General himself at paragraph 30 of Friday's legal advice, meaning there'll be no stopping the voice having a say on anything and everything, even if the Parliament tried to constrain it. Because, as I said, the Constitution trumps the Parliament. And as Chris Merritt, Legal Affairs Editor, of course, at The Australian, you see him often here on Sky News, as he has pointed out, no current or future government will be able to limit the subject matters of representations from the voice, be it defence, foreign affairs, education policy, roads, dams, banking policy, even inflation risk. It's all up for grabs if we vote in a system where 4% of the population gets an extra say over the remaining 96% of us.
In his submission, former Minister for Indigenous Affairs, former Attorney General Philip Ruddock, he says that he'd like to vote for The Voice, but he can't because he cannot support the proposal as it's currently drafted. Ruddick says, and I quote, these drafting issues leave open the possibility that The Voice may make representations to whatever agency it chooses on whatever topic it chooses, and that in doing so, there would be a corresponding burden placed on that agency. The common thread, he says, to all these issues is that they leave matters to be decided by the judiciary. Why, says my former boss, Tony Abbott, in his submission, why would we want to complicate our constitution by importing something into it akin to the British House of Lords? Now, an indigenous version of the House of Lords in Australia, well, that all sounds crazy, doesn't it? But what Abbott says is right. The voice is, after all, a new power structure based solely on ancestry, just as the House of Lords was, only open to aristocrats by their ancestry too at one time. Aboriginal elders like modern-day dukes and earls, based on a DNA entitlement and not meritocracy, we used to pride ourselves was the only criteria for office in Australia. What's clear here is that this debate's got a long way to run. The latest polling shows a yes victory is far from assured, with support for The Voice continuing to fall. Just 46% now support it, 39% are opposed. Those polls recorded over the weekend. As you know, I'm against a race-based voice in any form. I think the whole idea is wrong in principle and should be dropped because either way it will leave our country divided and embittered. But if the government persists, it must, this voice, it must be defeated.